Me. Um, <laughs> thank you so much for the uh, invitation to um, fill in. I'm sorry for anybody who thought they were getting Peter MBA. I'm sure I am a very sad substitute for him, but I'll do my best um, to, to bring something to this uh, session this morning. Um, just before I get underway, I, I just want to acknowledge all my colleagues uh, and others who have talked with me about the things I'm going to be talking about today and, and listened to previous presentations on similar subjects, because that's all helped form what you're going to hear. So in the time that I have, what I, I want to talk about a few different things. And I feel like I've really been set up well by what Kate and Jody have already said. And um, so one of the things we just want to establish is what's different about learning health systems. Why do, why do we want to think about um, ethics and data sharing in a, maybe a slightly different way than we have before? But on top of the, what's happening in the learning health system itself, what are the other things that are changing or what else is happening that we sh ought to bring into consideration for, for thinking through um, ethical implications? Uh, how do we balance risks and rewards is really one of the fundamental things we come down to. If we think of an ethical lens on things, it really is about trying to establish um, what risk is, will, is worth tolerating um, given the uh, public benefit that could come out of use of data. And then some thoughts on possible way and really should be ways um, forward. Okay, so one of, one of the first things that we know, and this is to me the, the big thing about learning health systems um, from a data perspective, is that there's just a lot more analytics going on. Um, so the idea of learning health systems is that we're constantly um, collecting data through the process of delivering care and using that data to make sure that we're improving um, the, the quality of service provision and, and ideally, of course, ultimately the outcomes of patients. And Jody already mentioned this, um, uh, one of the founding foundational papers in my view for this is this, um, this kind of proposal for a new ethical framework. And it, and it really does say that, I mean, my interpretation, it's got seven different um, considerations in there, but really what this comes down to is if we're talking about a learning health system, then every service event is a learning opportunity. And so this false distinction that we create between clinical care and research actually gets in the way of doing what we need to be doing. We just need to think about that differently. Okay, so it sounds like you talked about this a lot last year. Uh, probably lots of you in the room are familiar with that, so I'll just leave that aside then. That, but, but the more analytics is a, is a big piece of what we're talking about. I just, so I think it's a very necessary piece of the puzzle, but it's just not sufficient. There's other things going on that we need to worry about as well. And of course, part of this interest in learning health system is this idea that the world is just far more digitized than it used to be. This, this graph um, just shows the amount of storage in the world and then the amount of storage that's digital in the world. So you, really what it shows as much as anything is there's just been like astronomical growth in uh, the kind of information we have at, at our disposal, but more fundamentally for our purposes, the reason that that information is there is because we have digital storage technologies, which means we have the capability of potentially using that data as well. Um, Oh, th th this is always happens on this one little thing. So what th what that little what the what <coughs> what's that supposed to show is one of the things that happens because of this digital accumulation of data is that researchers have far greater aspirations than they used to about what they want access to to do their research projects. So in in what I see in my world running a data center in British Columbia is yes, of course you want the healthcare services data um, to, to look at your population, understand what's going on, but you also might want to add in early childhood indicators or education experience. You might want to add uh, immigration data, things about social determinants of health. So ultimately we're putting broader and broader sets of data together, and that raises some interesting issues. Now, add into that the fact that a lot of what people might want access to is biospecimens, genomic information, other things that are really, we all already understand to be quite at least potentially identifying. So if you take, we have research projects where there's 15, 16, 17 different data sets coming together, and some of that might be biospecimens, and then we're going to work in a world where we say, oh, but we've de-identified the data. 
I don't think so. I just don't think that that's really a, a reasonable thing to be stating anymore. When we have such high dimensional information about people, we have to treat the data as at least potentially re-identifiable. And more to the point, in the genomics world, there is a potential to identify family members as well as the people who are actually represented in the data. So I don't, I, by no, I'm a researcher, I think this is a really important stuff to be doing, but we need to be really conscious that more data and the aspirations of research and the fact that there's so much digital information available just means it's a different world than we used to live in. And the third thing that Kate really touched on a bit already is this idea of more automation. And, and really from the healthcare perspective, what we're really interested in is how do we use algorithms and other kind of routine processes that depend on data in order to understand what the best treatment pathways might be. So, um, and this is kind of the quantified self, personalized medicine sort of approach to things. So one of the things we might use genomic information for is to see whether you are the sort of person and who's going to respond well to a drug if you're going to experience side effects if the drug is going to be effective for you. And there's a million other things you could think about the development of algorithms to test these things. That's a really, really exciting thing to be able to do um, in the world of health, but is everybody here who knows the target story? Right? So uh, lots of you. So algorithms are not benign always, and they don't have to be even designed to be benign. You know, just very quickly for those who don't know, this Target story was about an algorithm developed by Target that ended up identifying a young girl as pregnant uh, before her father knew. So Target knew before the father did that, the, that this 15-year-old girl was pregnant. That's a, that's a little, um, maybe not, maybe something we should at least talk about a bit before we kind of go down this road further. Facebook, of course, I don't, I'm from Canada but I am from, I'm originally from Michigan, so I feel for you. This whole Facebook thing and the micro-targeting of advertisements during the last election, which was based originally on research done to identify personality types based on how you interact with Facebook. That's a little scary, right? That's, I mean, it's, it's insidious, something we should be talking about. Amazon, there's another story here where um, they're, uh, what is it called, the, the selector thing, so the algorithm that says, oh, you bought this book, maybe you'll like this book too. So there's a story about Amazon, oh, if you bought that supply, you might want this one too, and effectively put bomb-making things together to say, if you're buying one thing, maybe you want this other thing. Like, well, that's maybe, maybe we should think twice about that. I don't know, it's such a great idea. So the automation is great on the one hand, it has lots of promise, but it has some potential pitfalls as well that we, should have our eyes open about as we go forward. And fundamentally, I think we just need to recognize that in 2017, we're just not in Kansas anymore. So anybody here from Kansas? <laughs> so I, in, in Canada, when I've said this before, I said that's okay, because I'm not sure Kansas is such a great place. So I don't, so, <laughs> but it doesn't matter whether you love Kansas or don't, the fact is that we have gone from this you know, black and white world and we've opened the door and it is like beautiful and glorious out there but we better get our heads around what's happening or we're gonna end up in, in a world of trouble. So this is really what we wanna do. We wanna think about, from an ethical perspective, balancing the public good that can come out of this brave new world, let's just call it that, um, versus the risks that are, are there. And sometimes maybe we don't even know what those risks are. And I think the other important thing to think about in a, in a digital age this way is that it is a little bit like Pandora's box. So part of the risk here is there are things that we will not be able to undo once we do them. If your data gets out in the world, it's not gonna go away again. It's out there, right? This is what you teach our, our children, that if you make a post in social media, that's there forever. You might take it down off your site, but if anybody shared it, it's out there. So now the good thing is, if you know the story of Pandora's box, what's left after all the stuff comes out is hope, right? So the, there's still a possibility to get our heads around this, but we need to do that. And I think another thing to say about balancing risks and rewards, that a lot of times when you think about rewards, they're, they're kind of diffuse. They're, they, they might affect a whole population. We're trying to improve the healthcare system. So all of us, when we go use the healthcare system, can get benefit from it. So it's a very, um, uh, less tangible, future-looking kind of, of benefit. The risks, on the other hand, can be borne by particular groups more heavily than others. 
Um, so while, and this would be if you ha are a, an identifiable um, population with a rare condition or a certain kind of stigmatized disease. Um, so the, the rewards are diffuse, the risks are not always so diffuse. And that we need to be co um, cognizant of that when we're putting policies together. So here's where I come to where we might go in the future. This is my, um, this is my, when I talk about economics and the difference between technical efficiency and allocative efficiency. If, and the idea here is that if we are working in a system and just trying to, we keep, and I'm going to use the, the example of, of individualized consent. We, we live in a world that is dominated by the idea of individualized consent. And if we just keep trying to make that better and better, um, we may just completely miss the boat. So what we need to be thinking about is whether, and, and but I hasten to say I'm not saying that individual consent needs to be thrown out the window. There are absolutely places where it needs to be. I'm just not convinced it's the way we should be going forward in this context of uh, these big data enterprises, learning health system um, kinds of things, always. I think that part of what I'm, I'm thinking about here is um, I have a colleague who wrote this paper a while ago that was called Pulling Normative Rabbits from Positive Hats. And I feel in some sense that that's what we're in danger of doing. We have a system of informed consent. We're in the process of making it more and more fine-grained and more and more technically capable so people can opt in into this and out of that and into the other thing. But what we're trying to pull out of that very positive technical environment is fundamentally things that really ought to be informed by values and norms at a community level. And part of that is because in, in the world of automation and algorithms and so on, you will be affected by the algorithms whether you're in the data or not. So the idea that you're going to control what happens to you in this world by controlling your data, I think is a little bit um, out of date at this point. Okay, so what do we do? What's the possible way forward? One, just we need to accept that we are really aren't in Kansas anymore. And the world of the future probably needs different solutions than we used for the world of the past. I think um, one big thing that we can do here, and this really does relate to that, um, the, the work on learning health system ethical framework, is to take a proportionate approach to the way we think about what's allowable and what's not. So let's find the things that are lower risk that everybody can agree, agree are lower risk and let them happen and, and encourage and incentivize them to happen and then spend our time talking about and deliberating around the things that seem to be a bit higher risk where we might not have common agreement about whether it's okay or not in, in the particular use of data. And I think a big enormous part of this is actually going and engaging with the public. So because Fundamentally, we're talking about normative decisions and normative ways of looking at the world. We, those are value-based kinds of decisions. We can't make them as policymakers. We need to engage the public and get their input into the rules that a, a diverse group of community can live with. And that's where I'll end it. Thank you very much.